Hey Bears, welcome back. We are on chapter 16 of The Maze of Bones. And Dan and Amy are getting ready to go into the catacombs in Paris. Uncle Alistair said he will keep um, Ian and Natalie Cabra out of the catacombs for as long as possible to give them a head start. So let's dive right in. Think about those questions um, that you want to ask so that you can understand the text, okay? Chapter 16. Amy hated crowds, but the idea of plunging into the middle of seven million dead people didn't bother her. Nellie, Dan, and she hurried down a metal staircase. They found themselves in a limestone corridor with metal pipes running overhead and dim electric lights. The warm air smelled of mildew and wet rock. Only one exit, guys, Nellie said nervously. If we get caught down here, the tunnel should branch out soon, Amy said, trying to sound more confident than she felt. The stone walls were etched with graffiti. Some looked recent, some ancient. One inscription was engraved on a marble slab right above their heads. Stop mortals, Nellie translated. This is the empire of death. Cheerful, Dan muttered. They kept walking. The floor under Amy's feet was slushy gravel. Amy was still thinking about Uncle Alistair. Had he really known something about... Pages are sticking together about her parents, or was he just manipulating them? She tried to put it out of her mind. Where are the bones, Dan asked, and then they turned a corner into a large room and Dan said, oh. It was the creepiest place Amy had ever seen. Against the walls, human bones were stacked like firewood from the floor to above Amy's head. The remains were yellow and brown, mostly leg bones, but skulls stared out here and there like patches on a quilt. A line of skulls topped each stack. Amy walked in awed silence. The next room was the same as the first, wall after wall of moldering remains. Dim electric lights cast eerie shadows over the dead, making their empty eye sockets look even scarier. Gross, Melly managed. There's like thousands. Millions, Amy said. This is only one small part. They dug all these people up? Dan asked. Who would want that job? Amy didn't know, but she was amazed how the workers had made patterns with skulls and the stacks of femurs, diagonals, stripes, connect the dot shapes in a weird, horrible way. It was almost beautiful. In the third room, they found a stone altar with unlit candles. We need to find the oldest section, Amy said. These bones are too recent. Look at the plaque. It's from 1804. She led the way. Eyeless sockets of the dead seemed to stare at them as they passed. These are cool, Dan decided. Maybe I could... No, Dan, Amy said. You can't collect human bones. Ah. Nellie mumbled something that sounded like a prayer in Spanish. Why would Benjamin Franklin want to come down here? He was a scientist, Amy kept walking, reading the dates on the brass plaques. He liked public works projects. This would have fascinated him. Millions of dead people, Nellie said. Real fascinating. They turned down a narrow corridor and found themselves facing a metal gate. Amy shook the bars. The gate creaked open like it hadn't been used in hundreds of years. Are you sure we should go down there? Nellie asked. Amy nodded. The dates were getting older. On the other hand, there were no metal pipes on the ceiling up ahead, which meant no electric lights. Anybody got a flashlight? She asked. Yeah, Nellie said on my keychain. She pulled out her keys and handed them to Amy. There was a little push-button pin light. Not much, but better than nothing. They kept going. After a hundred feet, they emerged in a small room with only one other exit. Amy shone the flashlight on an old plaque framed in skulls. 1785. These have to be the first bones down here. The wall they were looking at was in bad shape. The bones were brown and crumbly, and some had scattered across the floor. The skulls along the top had been crushed, though the ones quilted in the wall looked fairly intact. They were done in a square pattern. Nothing exciting. Search around, Amy said. It has to be here. Dan stuck his hands into some of the gaps in the bone wall. Nellie checked the top of the stack. Amy looked into the skull's eye sockets with the flashlight, but she saw nothing. It's hopeless, she said at last. If there was anything here, another team must have found it. Dan scratched his head, and then he scratched a skull's head. Why are they numbered? Amy wasn't in the mood for his games. What numbers? Here on the forehead. Dan tapped one of the skulls. This guy was number three. Were they on a football team or something? Amy leaned in closer. Dan was right. The number was very, very faint, but scratched into the skull's forehead like someone had carved it with a knife was the Roman numeral three. 
She examined the skull below it. 19. A square pattern. Skulls with numbers. Check them all quick. It didn't take long. There were 16 skulls woven into the pile of bones done in four rows and four columns. Three of the skulls didn't have numbers. The rest did. They looked like this. Can you see the numbers etched in their foreheads? A chill went down Amy's back. Coordinates in a box. A magic box. What? Dan said, what magic? Dan, can you memorize these numbers and their placement? I already have. We need to get out of here and find a map. This is the clue. Well, the clue to the real clue, whatever Franklin was hiding. Wait a sec, Nellie said. Franklin scratched numbers on skulls. Why? It's a magic box, Amy said. Franklin used to play with numbers when he got bored. Like when he was sitting in the Philadelphia assembly and he didn't want to listen to the dull speeches, he would create magic boxes, number problems for himself. He'd fill in the missing numbers. The sums had to match horizontal, horizontally and vertically. Amy scowled. You're telling me Benjamin Franklin invented Sudoku? <laughs> well, yeah, in a way. And these are coordinates, Dan supplied. The missing sums show the location of the next clue. Clapping echoed through the room. Bravo! Amy turned. Standing in the entrance were Ian and Natalie Cabra. They found them. What is going to happen next? Oh, I told you they could do it, Ian said to his sister. I suppose, Natalie conceded. Amy hated that even underground in a room full of bones, Natalie managed to look glamorous. She was wearing a black velour cat suit, so she looked like 11 going on 23. Her hair hung loose around her shoulders. The only part of her outfit that didn't match was the tiny silver dart gun in her hand. Perhaps it wasn't all bad that Irina failed us. You, Dan yelled, you convinced Irina to set up at the Ile St. Louis. We all, you almost got us buried in cement. A shame it didn't work, Natalie said. You would have made a fine welcome mat for the mausoleum. But, but why? Amy stammered. Ian smiled. To put you out of commission, of course, and to give us extra time to find this place. We needed to make sure this wasn't some clever misdirection by our dear cousin Irina. I should have noticed the magic box earlier. Thanks for your help, Amy. Now, if you'll move aside, we'll just copy down those numbers and be off. Amy took a shaky breath. No. Ian laughed. Isn't she cute, Natalie, acting like she has a choice? Yes, Natalie wrinkled her nose. Cute. Amy blushed. The covers always made her feel so awkward and stupid, but she couldn't let them get the clue. She snatched up a leg bone. One move and I'll, I'll crush the skulls. You'll never get the numbers. It didn't sound like a very convincing threat, even to her, but Ian paled. Now, let's not be stupid. Amy, I know how nervous you get, but we won't hurt you. Not at all, Natalie agreed. She pointed her dark gun at Amy's face. I think poison six will be adequate. Nothing lethal, just a deep, deep sleep. I'm sure somebody will find you down here someday. A shadow loomed up behind the cabras. Suddenly, Uncle Alistair charged into the room and knocked Natalie to the ground. Her dart gun skittered away and Ian dove after it. Run, Alistair yelled. Amy didn't argue. She, Nellie, and Dan raced through the other exit into the darkness, deeper into the catacombs. It does seem like Uncle Alistair is helping them in this situation. Even though they were told, trust no one. Remember? Back in chapter two. Let's see where they run. They ran for what seemed like hours with nothing but the pin light to guide them. They turned down one corridor and found it blocked by a mound of rubble. They doubled back and followed another tunnel until it submerged completely in murky yellow water. Soon, Amy had no idea what direction they were heading. Alistair said there were police down here, she murmured. I wish one would find us. But they saw no one. The little flashlight started to dim. No, Amy said, no, no, no. They forged ahead, 50 feet, 60 feet. Their light went out completely. Amy found Dan's hand and squeezed it tight. It, it's going to be fine, kiddos, Nellie said, but her voice was quavering. We, we can't be lost down here forever. Amy didn't see why not. The catacombs went on for miles and had never been mapped completely. There was no reason anyone would come looking for them. We could shout for help, Dan said. Won't do any good, Amy said gloomily. I'm sorry, guys. This is not how I wanted things to end. It's not the end, Dan said. We could follow one wall until we find another exit. We could... Shh, Amy said. I'm just saying... No, Dan, seriously, be quiet. I thought I heard something. 
The tunnel was silent except for the distant drip of water. Then Amy heard it again, a faint rumbling from somewhere in front of them. A train? Millie asked. Amy's spirits lifted. We must be near a metro station. Come on. She shuffled forward with her hands outstretched. She shuddered as she touched a wall of bones, but she followed the corridor as it twisted to the right. Gradually, the rumbling sounds grew louder. Amy groped to the left. Her hand touched metal. A door, she cried. Dan, there's some kind of lock mechanism here. Come here, figure this out. Where? She found him in the dark and guided his hands to the lock. Within seconds, the latch creaked open and they were blinded by electric light. It took Amy a few moments to comprehend what she was seeing. The hatch was more like a window than a door, a square opening about five feet off the ground, just big enough to crawl through if they climbed up to it. They were eye level with the side of some railroad tracks, metal rails on wooden ties, and something brown and furry was scampering over the gravel bed. Amy jumped, a rat! The, ro the rodent regarded her, clearly unimpressed, and then scurried on its way. It's a rail pit, Dan said. We can climb out and... The light got brighter. The whole tunnel rumbled. Amy fell back and cupped her ears against the sound like a herd of dinosaurs. A train blasted past in a blur of metal wheels. It sucked the air right out of their tunnel, pulling her clothes and hair toward the hatch. And then, just as suddenly, it was gone. When she was sure her voice worked again, she said, We can't go out there. We'll get killed. Look, Dan said, there's a service ladder about five feet down. We'll crawl up to the rails, run to the ladder, climb to the platform. Easy. That's not easy. What if another train comes? We can time it, Nellie suggested. I have a clock on my iPod. She pulled it out of her pocket, but she'd hardly pressed the wheel before another train roared by. Nellie's glittery eyeshadow made her face look ghostly in the dim light. That was less than five minutes. The rails must be for express trains. We'll have to hurry. Right. Dan said, and just like that, he scrambled up and out the hatch. Dan, Amy shouted. He turned, crouching on the tracks. Come on. In a daze, Amy let Nellie give her a boost. With Dan's help, she crawled out. Now help me with Nellie, Dan said, but watch the third rail. Amy stiffened. Two feet away was the black electric rail that ran the trains. She knew enough about subways to understand that one touch would be worse than a thousand Franklin batteries. She helped Nellie out of the hatch, but it was a tight squeeze. They lost time. The rails hissed and clicked beneath them. I'm okay, Nellie said, brushing off her clothes. Let's get to the ladder. Dan started to follow, but he lurched when he tried to stand like he was caught on something. Dan, Amy said, it's my backpack. He said, it's wedged. He tugged at it helplessly. Somehow one strap had gotten looped around a metal rail and the rail had shifted, clamping the pack into place. Leave it, Amy cried. Nellie was already at the ladder, yelling at them to hurry. Passengers on the platform were starting to notice them too, and they were yelling in alarm, shouting in French. Dan slipped the backpack off his shoulder, but it was still stuck to the rail. He tugged at it and tried to open it, but he wasn't having any luck. Now, Nellie yelled. Amy could feel a faint rumbling in the tracks at her feet. Dan, she pleaded, it's not important. I can get it, just another second. Dan, no, it's just a backpack. It won't open. The far end of the tunnel lit up. Nellie was right above them on the platform, reaching out her hand. A lot of other passengers were doing the same, imploring them to grab hold. Nellie! Amy! Nellie cried. You first! She didn't want to, but maybe if she went first, Dan would see reason. She grabbed Nellie's hand and Nellie hauled her up from the rail pit. Immediately, Amy turned and stuck her hand out to Dan. Dan, please! She called. Now! The train's headlight flashed into sight. Wind rushed through the tunnel. The ground trembled. Dan gave the backpack another tug, but it wouldn't budge. He looked at the train and Amy saw he was crying. She didn't understand why. Dan, take my hand. She leaned out as far as she could. The train barreled down on them with a cry of anguish. Dan grabbed her hand, and with more strength than Amy knew she had, she yanked him out of the pit so hard they tumbled over each other. The train rushed on. When the noise died, the passengers on the platform all broke loose at once, scolding them in French while Nellie tried to explain and apologize. Amy didn't care what they were saying. She held her brother, who was crying harder than he had since he was little. She looked over the edge of the pit, but the backpack was gone, swept away into the tunnels by the force of the train. They sat for a long time while Dan shivered and wiped his eyes. Eventually, the passengers lost interest in them. They drifted away or stepped onto other trains and disappeared. No police came. 
Pretty soon it was just Nellie, Amy, and Dan sitting in a corner of the platform like a homeless family. Dan, Amy said gently, what was in there? What'd you have in the backpack? He sniffled and rubbed his nose. Nothing. It was the worst lie Amy had ever heard. Usually, she could tell what he was thinking just by looking at his face, but he was hiding his thoughts from her. She could only tell he was miserable. Forget it, he said. We don't have time. Are you sure? I said forget it. We need to figure out that number box before the cobras, don't we? She didn't like it, but he was right. Besides, something told her that if they stayed here much longer, the police would come and start asking questions. She took one last look at the rail pit where Dan had almost died and the dark hatch that led into the catacombs. Fear still coursed through her body, but they'd been through too much to give up now. Let's go then, she said. We got a clue to find. Do you remember what was in Dan's backpack? We're going to find out. Outside it had started to rain. By the time they found a cafe, Dan seemed back to normal, or at least they'd come to a silent agreement that they would act like everything was normal. They sat under the awning to dry off while Nellie ordered food. Amy didn't think she could eat, but she was hungrier than she realized. It was five in the afternoon. They'd been in the catacombs a long time. Amy shuddered as she thought about Ian and Natalie and the poison dart gun. She hoped Uncle Alistair was right. She still didn't trust him, but there was no denying he'd saved them in the catacombs. She had terrible thoughts of the old man lying alone and unconscious in the maze. As they ate brie and mushroom sandwiches, Dan drew skulls and Roman numerals on a napkin. 12, 5, 14, he said. Those are the missing numbers. Amy didn't bother checking his math. He never messed up on number problems. Maybe it's an address or something, she said. Nellie wiped off her iPod. Wouldn't the address have changed in 200 years? Amy got a hollow feeling in her gut. Nellie was probably right. Paris might not have had the neighborhood system when Franklin had lived there, and the street address definitely would have changed, in which case Franklin's clue is no good anymore. Would Grace have sent them on a search that couldn't be finished? Why not? A resentful voice said inside of her. Grace didn't care enough to tell you about the quest in person. If Dan had died in that rail pit, it would have been Grace's fault. No, she decided that wasn't true. Grace must have had a reason. The numbers must refer to something else. Amy could think of only one way to find out, the same thing she did whenever she had an unsolvable problem. We need to find a library. Nellie talked to the waiter in French, and he seemed to understand what they want. Pas de problèmes, he said. He drew a map of a, on a fresh napkin and scribbled the name of a metro station, École Militaire. We have to hurry, Nellie said. He says the library closes at six. Half an hour later, soggy and still smelling like the catacombs, they arrived at the American Library in Paris. Perfect, Amy said. The old building had black metal security bars over the doorway, but they were open. Peering inside, Amy saw stacks of books and plenty of comfortable places to read. Why should these guys help us, Dan asked. I mean, we don't have a library card or anything. But Amy was already climbing the steps. For the first time in days, she felt absolutely confident. This was her world. She knew what to do. The librarians came to their aid like soldiers responding to a battle cry. Amy told him she was researching Benjamin Franklin, and within minutes, Amy, Dan, and Nellie were sitting at a table in a conference room, examining reproductions of Franklin documents. Some so rare, the librarians told her, the only copies existed in Paris. Yeah, here's a rare grocery list, Dan muttered. Wow. He was about to toss it aside when Amy grabbed his wrist. Dan, you never know what's important. Back then, there weren't many stores. If you wanted to buy something, you had to send the merchant an order and have your stuff shipped. What did Franklin buy? Dan sighed. Please send the following. Three, Treaties on Cider Making by Cave. Two, Nelson on the Government of Children. Eight, Volume by Dodsley. Quantity one. Iron Solute. Letters from a Russian officer. Hold it, Amy said. Iron Solute. Where have I heard that before? It was on that other list, Dan said without hesitation, in one of the letters we saw in Philadelphia. Amy frowned, but Iron Solute isn't a book. This whole list is books, except for that. What's Iron Solute anyway, Dan asked. Oh, guys, I know this, Nellie chimed in. She held up her hands and closed her eyes like she was remembering the answer to a test. It's like a chemical solution, right? They use it for metalworking and printing and a bunch of other stuff. Amy stared at her. How do you know that? Hey, it's a chemistry last semester. I remember because the professor was talking about, like, how they make high-end cooking equipment. Franklin probably used iron solute for his ink when he was a printer. 
That's great, Dan muttered, except for the fact that it's completely unimportant. Now, can we get back to the magic box coordinates? Amy still felt something nagging in the back of her head like she was missing a connection, but she rifled through the rest of the papers. Finally, she unfolded a huge yellowing document that turned out to be an old-fashioned map of Paris. Her eyes widened. This is it. Amy put her finger proudly over a spot on the map. A church. St. Pierre de Montmartre. That's where we need to go. How can you be sure? Nellie asked. The numbers form a grid, see? She pointed to the margins. This is an old surveyor's map by a couple of French scientists, Comte de Buffon and Thomas Francois de Olivard. I remember reading about them. They were the first to test Franklin's lightning rod theories. After they proved the rods worked, King Louis the Sixteenth ordered them to draw up a plan to outfit all the major buildings in Paris. That church was the 14th installation at coordinates 5 by 12. Franklin would have known about the work. He was really proud how the French took to his ideas. This has to be it. I'll bet you a box of French chocolate will find an entrance to the catacombs at the church. Dan looked doubtful. Outside, the rain was really coming down. Thunder shook the windows of the library. What if the cobras get there first? We have to make sure that doesn't happen, Amy said. Come on. Well, these siblings sure work well together. I want you to make sure you fill out the form on my website. I'll link it in the uh, caption below. See you guys for chapter 17. We're almost done.